Okay, good morning and welcome back to Take 10 Listings. This is week two. I'm your host, teacher, trainer, and maybe even a coach that will, well, at least I have the intention to get more out of you than you can get out of yourself. Uh, during these six weeks of the Take 10 Listing program, we're going to spending a lot of time on solicitation and unique selling propositions and objectioning, objection handling techniques. We're going to spend uh, a lot of next week on actually meeting new people. You're going to start to get assignments that have you poking your head out of the little turtle shell or going out of your comfort zone, uh, you know, a little uh, you know, risk-taking through social media, telephone, door knocking, or farming. <clears throat> and then during the last couple of weeks, we're going to spend a little bit more time on presenting and following up with sellers. But I hope by now you understand the reason the list to last uh, cliche was born. The higher return on investment, the higher credibility that a listing agent has in the marketplace, the additional benefits of signage and syndication, the opportunity for you to do multiple transactions with one consumer and to meet more buyers. If, if that doesn't grab you, maybe it's the six-figure income that can be generated by just taking 10 listings each year. Sometimes we forget that the listings turn into upgrade sellers. Sometimes we forget that we refer some of our sellers out to buy across state lines or even across the country. <clears throat> and last but not least, each listing produces buyers. Uh, you know, two, three, four buyers a week per listing times 10 listings, and all of a sudden you've got several extra closed real estate transactions that came out of that hard work that you did to get the 10 listings. So we built you up a mathematical equation that we think is very, very conservative to show you how you can make doctor money, six-figure incomes, by just doing some of the solicitation work that very, very few real estate agents are willing to do. At the $250,000 price point, you're looking at about $110,000, $120,000 in income. If you're a little higher up on the economic food chain and you're in the three and a quarter range, you're going to see closer to $150,000 in income just from taking those 10 listings. And uh, if you're in the upper middle class, kind of upper middle America, you know, $450,000 houses, these are not luxury houses in most markets. They're nice, very nice, well, you know, good earners, but it's not the top, top, top luxury market in most areas, 10 listings would bring you in well, I think well above $200,000 in income. And you start to dwell upon that and you start to say to yourself, you know, if if I'm willing to go to school for four years and to get out and make, you know, 30, 40, 50, $60,000 first year, you know, maybe I'm going to be an accountant, maybe I'm going to be a uh, a mechanical engineer or a chemical engineer. Maybe I'm going to do something in the in the trades. You know, it takes years and years and years to get those skills from a college or a, even a, a vocational technical school or an apprenticeship program. But here you've got this this incredible opportunity to do some things that no one else is willing to do, and you're going to see that theme through these next couple of weeks. You personally have to decide if you're willing to do the things that most realtors aren't willing to do. And part of that is to upgrade your skills and manage your tasks. And hopefully we can hold you accountable. So there was a little secret in the week one assignment, and it was to study your telemarketing works agenda. We handed you a one page sheet of paper, which we're going to review today. And in that were some secrets and some hints about how you might devise your 60 to 120 second message and if you did your assignment you dialed our phone and left us a voicemail potentially you took the time to send us a note whether it was a 
elaborate letter on your company's letterhead, or if it was a handwritten note inside of a particular, you know, folding note card. We asked you to study your telemarketing works agenda. And then from what you learned, tell me why I should call you. You know, in a note, why should I call you? Uh, why are you the realtor that I should call? We also asked you to study your telemarketing works agenda and to devise a message uh, that you could send me in an email. You know, why should I call you uh, versus my sister's brother's cousin's friend who's a realtor? Why should I call you rather than calling the buy owner company or going down to Home Depot and buying a, a red and white sign and sticking it in my yard? Why should I call you instead of the the big, you know, Century 21 office right on the corner by my neighborhood? You know, why should I go to you instead of them? And last but not least, we we asked you to find us on social media. Find me on social media. And there was a there was a layer of effort there. And and all of the effort that you have to put in when you're being coached is exactly like a an athlete who's preparing for his competition upcoming or her competition upcoming. These aren't exercises to make me feel good as a coach. These are exercises for you to understand that there's labor. There's labor in putting together an email. There's labor in putting together a, 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 a handwritten note or a telephone script to leave. And some of you got nervous, you know, some of you experienced some anxiety. Like, what do I say? How do I say it? Do I, will I sound good? Will I not sound good? Others of you have the experience to already feel comfortable with solicitation and the channels of solicitation. But this particular assignment was interesting. This, this social media assignment piece was interesting because, you know, in your local market, a listing expires on a Wednesday night. And on Thursday, dozens and dozens of realtors are trying to reach that seller. But you took the time to go into social media and find the seller in LinkedIn and or Facebook, and you sent them a message. You didn't just stop by calling and leaving a voicemail. You went above and beyond and sent out a handwritten note. You, you went above and beyond and found them via social media and used that uh, that new medium to affiliate with them or friend them and then open dialogue with earnest, you know? Now, we, we focused on studying your telemarketing works agenda, but it was all meant to demonstrate to you that there are actually six solicitation channels for you to approach a seller. And if we could embed or tattoo anything into your mind's eye, it would be that picking up the phone is not good enough. Sending mail is not good enough. Finding a seller and emailing them, it's not good enough. You have to use all six solicitation channels. I'm, I'm, I work for a multi-billion dollar mortgage company, and we're in the process of mastering all six solicitation channels because sometimes a consumer inquires uh, on a mortgage and then doesn't take one out for four, six, nine, 12 months later. Well, you have to master the six solicitation channels in order to build a perfect sales funnel. And that means that from the moment you start talking to a seller to the moment that he or she lists her home with someone, you've stopped by their home and dropped something off at some time. You've texted them or maybe you learned how to master that new phenomenon called text bots so that there's an automated text that goes out to your seller uh, twice a week uh, if he's engaged, right? Or once a week or once a month if he's not. Mastering the six solicitation channels 
understands how to use quips or little lines that that induce a sense of credibility and or interest or call to action you know not being overbearing on emails or direct mail but using all six solicitation channels to touch a consumer and to court the consumer into believing that you're a credible you know honest interested hardworking party so the reason we said study your telemarketing works agenda is because on this telemarketing works agenda we don't call it a script we call it an agenda we have opening lines the reason that I'm calling is that last week I pulled your property up on Fifth Avenue I was searching for four bedrooms this morning when I pulled it up I noticed that you had taken it off the market that's an interesting opening line uh, second one halfway down we just sold the house on 8th Street we've got a lot of activity still on that house even though it's sold now and I wanted to find out everything I could find out about your house so I might help you be able to get it sold that's if they're a buy owner or an expired. Maybe it's different. Maybe it's the third one down. We just sold the house on 8th Street and we're still having good activity because you know how it works in internet marketing. The listing sold, but it's still all over the internet. And during the past few weeks, we've been getting a lot of inquiries on four bedrooms in your neighborhood. Let me just ask you a hypothetical question. If I were able to sell your home and close on it, within 60 days as an as an example you know so that you were out of your home and moved by umpty ump date would you consider moving while the kids are out of school would you consider moving this spring would you consider maybe moving in the next four to six months if the price were really right another opening line that we like to use is we've had good activity i wanted to find out everything your home about your home so that I might be able to help you get it sold. I've been a real estate agent here in the area for, you know, X number of years. If you haven't been a real estate agent in the area for a long time, then say we have, you know, we've been selling homes just like yours for the past 25 years. And I wanted to check up on you and see if, if you really do want to get your home sold. Now, right below the opening lines, the opening lines are important because it's like a, it's like a little jab, you know, in a boxing match, it's jab, 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 knockout. Well, a jab or a, a quip or a curious way to opening a conversation is your job. You have to come up with the best opening line that fits your personal selling style. And it's worth time to develop that. Another area is how do you keep a conversation moving? You know, we call that clever conversations. The mortgage market has loosened up a lot. Four bedroom homes are in a, in, in a high demand right now. The inventory of move in ready properties are, are really at an all time low and, and they are climbing. The inventory is climbing, but right now, you know, it's a good time to get your house on the market because there's not that much competition. Buyers don't want to run down foreclosure. They don't want to wait six to eight months for a short sale to be approved they want to move in ready home just like yours and this spring really might be the best time to make a move so could i ask you if the price were really right and i mean really right you really liked the price and you were able to find a place to move that you liked would you consider moving this spring just a light clever conversation then we move to appearing interested in the telemarketing works agenda if it's an expired or a buy owner so why do you feel your house hasn't sold can i ask you why you decided to sell your home without a real estate brokerage is your home a true four bedroom or a true three bedroom does it have three bedrooms with closets i noticed that you had it listed with a large family room can you tell me a little bit about the family room just getting them talking the general rule of solicitation is that when the other person is talking they never hang up on you when the other person is talking, they never slam the door in your face. So have you done any updating since you've owned the property? How do you feel like your flooring 
compares to the rest of the neighborhood? Would you say that it's average, above average, or does your flooring need updating? How about your master bathroom? How about your kitchen? You, you, can, you can create clever conversations and appear, create an, 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 an environment that you're interested, genuinely interested in what they have to say. Rather than approaching a for sale bond or an expired, an absentee owner, or a farming client, or even a friend or family member with a sense of entitlement that they're supposed to want to give you 6% of the sale of their home for some unknown reason, they should want to give this to you. Instead, why don't you nurture and serve the relationship with earnest and integrity by asking some thoughtful questions? Now, the first line of asking thoughtful questions we just used on uh, this past week with a client, she was listed with her friend and she was frustrated. And she was five and a half months into the listing, and she had inquired on one of the the um, the solicitations that we put out there. Now we're not allowed to approach her because she's currently listed, but she inquired to us about a home that was for sale. She saw a solicitation on Facebook, by the way, and she said, uh, "You know, I'm interested in this house." Well, when we got her on the phone. She said, I'm so frustrated, I'm so frustrated, I'm so frustrated. And the line we used was, if you ever found a really good, really competent real estate agent, would you still consider moving this summer? And she said, oh my God, yes, I would, but I'm so frustrated. We've been on the market for five and a half months. We haven't done any of this. We haven't done any marketing. Well, people who are near the end of their listing agreement or just recently expired or for sale by owner for many weeks or, you know, thinking about making a movie. Sometimes they're frustrated. They're nervous. And you say to them, have you ever, if you ever found a really good, really competent real estate agent, would you at least consider making a move this summer? Have you looked at how affordable your mortgage is going to be on your new home? See, having a, a, a low interest rate on the one they're moving to is a sexy way to entice and, and build a sense of urgency. Have you started looking for houses at all? Have you received any offers on your house? Ooh, a little misspell misspelling there. Third line down on Ask Thoughtful Questions. Is there a chance you could be missing some of the buyers by not being on the market? You know, that's if it's a for sale by owner or an expired. Do you think it would be interesting to see the difference how would it feel if we mobilize the entire real estate community and really leverage the World Wide Web to market your home? Do you think we could increase the demand that you're, you're seeing on your home? Of course, that's if it's a for sale owner. And then remember in the beginning of the Telemarketing Works agenda, we said jab, 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 knockout punch. Well, the knockout punch, after several earnest, light conversations and asking some thoughtful questions and appearing interested in the upgrades of their home and and what their you know motivation is 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 a deep dive if i could would you at the bottom of your page you start to see that the if i could would you formula is the way that most top salespeople close so if i could show you why you know Spring of 2019 is the best time to sell your home. If I could show you how we can capitalize and get you the highest possible price, would you at least allow me to come over and drop off some of my marketing materials? So I could show you how timing this market this spring would probably be the best move for you. If I showed you that, would you at least want me to come over and bring my marketing materials? If I could actually sell your home and close for 185. That's assuming they're asking 185. And I could show you how I could do that in the next 60 days. Would you at least want me to come over? I mean, I could show you how we sold that house on 8th Street in under a month. We just did it. And your house is very similar to that one. If I could show you why your home will sell for more money if you close this spring or this summer while the kids are out of school. Would you want me to come over and sit down with you? And I love this close. I probably use this close 60% of the time. 
What I think we should do is just sit down and do some math. By doing some basic math, you'd have all the information that you need to make a decision. And I could leave that math with you. Don't worry. I'll come over. We'll go over why this this spring and, and why this summer might be the best time to sell. And then we'll do some math together. And when we do our math together, you'll be able to know if it's the right time to make a decision. Because you'll see the math, you know, we'll do the math together. And then the last, if I could, would you on the far right, if it was a buy owner and I said, if I could show you how actually you could actually make more money working with an aggressive real estate brokerage and buying your new house. So by, by using our company to sell the one you're selling and to buy the one you're thinking about buying. If I could show you how you would actually make more money doing that, could I come over and do some math with you and your husband? And again, it's just sit down with a calculator and show you the mathematics. I'll just do the math with you. And you could see it and you can play with the numbers on your own. And, you know, whether you list your house tonight, two weeks from now or two months from now, I don't have a preference. These are eloquent closing techniques. They don't feel like closing techniques because you're, you're, you're a consummate professional who's interested in what's best for the consumer, but you do have to induce a sense of action. Your, your job is to, to, to propel the decision-making forward. So by clever conversation, appearing interested in asking thoughtful questions, you have the ability to then bring them to the point of, and if I could, would you close? And the if I could, would you's that we demonstrated there, we've been using, whether it's in an email, whether it's in a text, and I'm just going to go back to the six channels of solicitation. You know, does it matter if you're standing at the front door that you just stopped by to drop something off and you move to, if I could, would you? Does it matter if you're texting them and you ask some of those thoughtful questions and then you move to an if I could, would you in a text? Does it matter if you've friended them on Facebook or LinkedIn and then you ask them some thoughtful questions on, on social media in an in-message? Each channel of solicitation is equally useful. In fact, certain consumers prefer social media or text over calls or emails, but some Consumers prefer eyeball to eyeball. Stop by. They liked you when they saw you there. Or maybe they got a handwritten note and they go, oh, nobody sends handwritten notes anymore. That's a nice guy. I like this guy. But don't, don't ever guess which one they're going to like. You working within one silo of solicitation channels is a big mistake. You've got to use all six and use the opening lines and use the clever conversations, use the appearing interested agenda and the thoughtful questions to build up to the closing question, which probably is phrased like, if the math made sense, should I come over and, and, and take a look at your home? If I could show you some math tonight that made sense, would you allow me to come over and sit down with you for a few minutes? Can I just come and take a look at the house so I'm aware of what the condition is? If I could come over and take a look at the house, would you at least show me around the house? That's a light one. But it's always if I could, would you? The other assignment that you guys had for week one was a bonus assignment that I asked you if you'd take the time to learn the six-figure secrets and learn the power of proper written goals because as your coach, we would like to induce a sense of higher purpose. You know, what's your why? Uh, and I will just say as a neutral third party, you're not going to trudge through broken glass. You're not going to climb through the, the pipeline of sewage to get out of Shawshank to get to the coast of Mexico unless you really know what you're climbing through that junk for. <laughs> You know, I'm, I'm talking about an analogy of the Shawshank Redemption where he, he had the vision to get out of his prison and he had to climb through a, a pipeline of shit, excuse my French, to get to the point where he could go to 
the Mexican coast and, and get where he wanted to be. But if he didn't have that specific vision for where he wanted to be, he might have been like Red or some of the other prisoners in Shawshank that that lost hope. Some of them lost hope and they didn't want to get out of prison. There was one one prisoner that actually killed himself when he got out of prison because he had no vision for his future. A life without vision will perish. And if you don't have a strong, defined sense of purpose and why, you're not going to do this work. That brings me to an interesting point. And this isn't an assignment. This is an illustration. This is for you to take a peek into the world of highly successful residential real estate professionals. It says at the top of your screen that success or high, high levels of success in residential real estate as a profession is is created when you personally do some things that no one else is willing to do. And you do those things for a few years. And when you do something that no one else is willing to do for a few years, what happens is you get what no one else is able to get for the rest of your life. And I've seen that quote configured and paraphrased in entrepreneurship and success, but it has to do with doing some things that no one else is willing to do. The first thing that very few people are willing to do is to have written goals and a plan to achieve them. I would submit to you as a neutral third party that if you just did that one thing, the trajectory of your real estate career changes immediately. Just the act of having written goals and creating plans to achieve those written goals is the catalyst for greatness in most people. But how many of you didn't feel like completing your coaching assignments? There's a a prime example of something that most people aren't willing to do, but that you're willing to do even though you don't want to. Damn it, you know, this seems like a exercise in futility. I don't even want to do this. What about mastering all six channels of solicitation? That's something that most people don't aren't willing to do. You know that I have six or eight email uh, templates that I use, that I have six or eight calling scripts that I use, that I have six or eight emails uh, or direct mail pieces that I send. I have social media messages that I simply cut and paste, and I've mastered the texting, whether it's using bots or using... Uh, just hand typed in text or cut and paste texts using uh, there's things like uh, SMS magic or Spokio or different systems that allow you to send out texts and mastering the art, the very, very sincere art of stopping by someone's home without feeling intrusive, you know, Uh, mastering all six channels of solicitation is something that most people are not willing to do. What about farming an area every single month for 36 months? You know, most people are willing to start a farm, but they're not willing to finish it. And some people farm only the high-end area where every other realtor is attracted. What I might look at doing is farming an area that's maybe older homes that aren't being farmed by other agents as much. And to do that same area and farm it for 36 months, that's an illustration of some things that most people aren't willing to do. But when you do those things that most people aren't willing to do for 36 months, you get what no one else gets for the rest of your life. You're now a a high six-figure earner who's taking vacations, probably has a personal assistant, really looks credible, and is performing in the top 5% of realtors in the country. Do two open houses a month every month for 36 months. Most people just aren't willing to do that. I mentioned a broker owner that had 14,000 leads in, in, in you know, a Boomtown leads account or a conversion account. And his biggest complaint to us was no one's willing to call those leads. No one's willing to call them. No one's willing to email them. No one's willing to text them. No one's willing to, to send a note to them or, or even pick up the phone. I'll tell you right there, the last bullet on your screen. Ask your broker if you're allowed to call the old leads. Say, you know what? I'm going to sit down for two hours a day. I'm going to do three hours, three times a week. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 10 to noon, I'm calling all the leads. I'm willing to do that because no one else is willing to. And I'm going to get a deal a day or I'm going to get a deal a week 
out of calling those leads. You know, it, it comes down to stones. It comes down to burning desire. It comes down to an ambition that's matched, uh, matched only by the task, the rigor of doing the tasks. Most people are just not willing to do that. Post an auction.com property. Post a HUD.gov property. And just write an ad on Craigslist about an upcoming auction.com property that's in your market. Or a HUD foreclosure that's in your market. Find a, a, a new construction development that's priced right and post that new construction uh, home, one of the models, in Craigslist or in eBay Classified or in the Facebook Marketplace and do 10 ads a week. Just 10. They take about 5 to 10 minutes to do. But imagine that you sat down every Monday morning from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. Every single Monday morning for the next 150 weeks. See, that's where the meat is. That's where the rubber meets the road. It's not that you'll place an ad. It's not that you'll call the leads. It's not that you'll do an open house. It's not that you'll farm an area. It's not that. It's the fact that you're the only person that's willing to do it consistently over a year, two years, three years. Think about that, guys. Everybody's willing to go to one BNI meeting, but what if you Googled BNI, you found a chapter that didn't have a realtor, and you committed to go to 36 BNI meetings before you quit? That's what we're talking about here. That's when the success comes in greater um, ferocity than what you could ever expect. You know, Maybe you fell in love with Homes for Heroes or Hero Home Source. I love Hero Home Source. It's a nonprofit company. They help realtors meet first responders and veterans. And maybe you said, I'm going to market to first responders every month for three years before I judge it. That's the stuff that most people aren't willing to do. And that's why no one else gets to enjoy a first class ticket to, to Paris. No one else gets to enjoy five star dining. No one else gets to enjoy uh, Rich Carlton and, and the Four Seasons, and, and no one gets to go to little boutique hotels on the coast of the Caribbean. They're all stuck in this rut of sameness where they're willing to take out a buyer once a week and maybe sell six or eight homes a year, but they're not willing to do the things that will propel their residential real estate career to the next level. So if you're going to get stymied, it's going to be because you didn't do the work. Remember I said, I guarantee you didn't do the work. But there's one other area you can get stymied. It's when you you don't know how to handle objections. You don't know how to properly at, answer questions. So remember we played the game during the week one assignment that I was a seller and that you sent me an email, a note. You sent me a letter or a note and you sent me a text or a um, voicemail. And then last but not least, you sent me a, a message in my inbox on Facebook or LinkedIn. Well, we take that to the next level now and we say, all right, okay, champ, I'm, I'm interested. Thanks for reaching out to me. I'm responding. But be before I decide if I want you to come over to my house, because that's a big commitment for me, I have a private home and I'm inviting you a complete and total stranger into my home. It's an honor and a privilege to be asked into someone's home. You need to respect the gravity of just having you come over to my home. So before I ask you to come over to my home, I want you to answer one, two questions. So what's your commission? And I'm going to promise you six out of 10, maybe eight out of 10 consumers are going to ask you that question before they allow you to come over to their home. Do you think it might be worth your time to devise the proper answer to that question? And I will tell you as an observer of human behavior that happened to be selling real estate for the past 32 years, I've watched strikeout after strikeout after strikeout with a consumer that asked that question of a realtor 
and it kills the deal because they don't answer that question properly or they seem too emphatic about their answer and the consumer gets cold feet and turns around and goes the other way. So let's imagine that I have a $700,000 home. I'm responding to your email and you need to answer the question. What is your commission? That's all I want to know before you come over. Now, the only other question that comes up uh, six to eight times out of 10 is, hey, I appreciate you reaching out to me. How much do you think my house is worth? What do you think my house is worth? Before I decide if you can come over to my house, I just want to know what you think my house is worth. Sellers ask that question very, very frequently, especially when you're in that point where they're deciding which realtor they want to pick, like an expired listing, a buy owner, an absentee owner, somebody who maybe was on the market six months ago and took their house off the market. Sometimes they're going to test their realtor by just asking them, you know, how much do you think my house is worth? And it's the credibility that you demonstrate in the way that you answer the question that decides whether you have positive professional control. When you answer the question like a rookie, when you answer the question like a part-timer, when you answer the question like a uninformed, wandering generality, you, your credibility goes down. And they go, I don't want this kid to come over to my house. I don't want that lady to come over to my house. Because the way that she answered the question, what is your commission, didn't sound right to me. I didn't like the way it felt. Or I asked her how much my house is worth, and she said it was worth 280. I thought it was worth 320. So I don't like that realtor anymore. Or she said it was worth 350, and it sounded like she was just trying to sell me a bill of goods because I don't think my house is worth 350. Or she beat it around the bush and she didn't give me a straight answer, and I didn't like that. Or she answered me very assertively and said, you know, this, that, or another thing, and I want I, I think she sounded credible. Do you understand that when a seller is asking a question or throwing an objection at you, it's not that they don't want you to list their home. It's actually the opposite. They want to find out if you have the credibility, trustworthiness, integrity, intelligence, work ethic to be invited into their home. So you have an assignment for week two. I need you to answer the question, what is your commission? In your own words, as if I was getting ready to list a $700,000 home, and when I ask you, what is my house worth, you need to answer me in a way that makes you seem credible. And I'll, just, I'll, I'll help you out during week three as to what the most effective means for answering these two questions are. But before we get to week three, you've got to answer the question, what is your commission and how much is my house, house worth? Look, guys, next week is week three, and we're going to dig into meeting new people through social media, telephone, door knocking, bold leads, and other services and farming. But for now, we're wrapping up week two. How do you create a sense of urgency with unique selling propositions? If I could, would you? And how are you handling objections or questions when they come up? Complete those two assignments, and we will meet you back here for week three, where we'll give you some of the most effective ways to handle those objections, and we'll give you some really exciting new and easy ways to meet new people through social media, telemarketing, door knocking, and services that can put you in front of sellers. So thanks very much for being on. That's week three. Pay special attention to your Annie Mac home mortgage loan officer this week. Please reach out to him and say I or her and let her know how much you appreciate the coaching program. It does our company a world of good to get your tangible feedback to your loan officers. Let them know if you appreciate it. Let them know if you think it's a waste of time. But if you do appreciate it, say, hey, I really want to work with you more in the future. Thank you for helping me with taking 10 listings. And I want to work with you more closely on prequals and loan applications in the future. I really want to create a one-stop shopping experience for my consumers and help them with their mortgage planning and their real estate purchasing together with you. Uh, I appreciate that. And I certainly hope you'll pay your appreciation and um, and some sense of, of, of camaraderie with Annie Mac Home Mortgage. Thanks again for being on. We'll see you next week, week three.